time to let the American broomstick fly and hear the sounds of freedom. LD is go for launch. SpaceX on Wednesday successfully launched 48 new Starlink satellites into orbit on a Falcon 9 rocket from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. The rocket's first stage then returned to Earth for a smooth touchdown at sea on the SpaceX drone ship. This was the fourth landing for this particular booster. The first two missions on that list, Arabsat 6A and Space Test Program 2, were flown by Falcon Heavy rocket, which consists of three Falcon 9 cores strapped together and the central one topped by a second stage. SpaceX confirmed on Twitter that the rocket's upper stage successfully deployed the satellites into orbit about 80 minutes after lifting off. The next Starlink mission, carrying 46 satellites into a 540 km high and 53.2 degrees inclined orbit, is scheduled to lift off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on March 19. Ukraine Vice Prime Minister and Minister of Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, recently confirmed that the second truckload of Starlink terminals has arrived in Ukraine. Elon Musk confirmed the shipment, noting that SpaceX also sent power adapters for car cigarette lighters, solar and battery packs, and satellite internet system generators. Earlier this month, after the first batch of Starlink terminals arrived in Ukraine, Musk announced the company was doing even more to help keep the government and citizens connected in the middle of the war. As Ukraine suffers from attacks against its infrastructure, including electricity providers, Musk said his company is updating the software of the Starlink terminals to use less power, so that even just a car cigarette lighter would provide enough power to run the Starlink terminals. Showing just how serious the situation is in the country, Musk also warned Starlink users that the chances of the terminals being targeted by the Russians are high, as it is the only non-Russian communications system still working in some parts of Ukraine. To keep as safe as possible, Musk suggested to only turn on Starlink when needed and place antenna as far away from people as possible and to camouflage the dish to avoid visual detection. Recently, during a talk at the California Institute of Technology, SpaceX President Gwynne Shotwell said the company worked for six weeks to bring Starlink satellite internet service to Ukraine ahead of a formal request from government officials of the besieged country. According to her, SpaceX had been waiting for a formal authorization letter from the Ukrainian government to provide services in the country, but it never arrived before Russian forces invaded the country on February 24. She noted that providing Starlink was the right thing to do, because the best way to uphold democracies is to make sure we all understand what the truth is. Astra believes it has figured out what went wrong during last month's failed mission, which was the company's first mission with operational payloads on board. On February 10, Astra's 13-meter-tall two-stage launch vehicle, LV0008, lifted off from Florida's Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, carrying four tiny CubeSats on a mission organized by NASA's Educational Launch of Nanosatellites, or ELANA. The rocket flew well at first, but encountered problems shortly after stage separation, about three minutes into the flight. The rocket's upper stage began to tumble at this point, as seen by a camera mounted on the rocket. The rocket could not recover from this non-nominal situation, resulting in the mission's termination and the satellite's loss. Um, unfortunately, we heard that an issue has been experienced during flight that prevented the delivery of our customer payloads to orbit today. We are deeply sorry to our customers, NASA, the University of Alabama, um, the University of New Mexico, and the University of California, Berkeley. Astra has been investigating the anomaly for nearly a month now. In a March 6 statement, the company said the root cause was an error in an electrical harness engineering drawing for the payload fairing that kept all its separation mechanisms from firing. That in turn kept the fairing from separating until the rocket's upper stage, which is encapsulated by the fairing, fired its engine. Astra said tests before launch didn't find the problem since those merely confirmed that the fairing was wired as designed, rather than detecting a flaw in the wiring design itself. The payload fairing did successfully separate on the previous launch in November 2021, the first time the vehicle reached orbit. A second issue with the February launch was with the thrust vector control system on the upper stage. The stage started tumbling immediately after engine ignition, likely because it ran into the fairing. Astra said it corrected the payload fairing wiring harness flaw and instituted new tests that would be able to detect this problem for future vehicles. It also upgraded the software to better handle packet losses. The failure of the vehicle was the fourth failure in five orbital launch attempts by the company. With the corrective actions implemented, Astra is looking to make a return to flight in the coming days. The company targets a launch date no earlier than March 13 for the LV0009 mission. 
OneWeb has said it is in discussion with Ariane Space on how its contracted launches will be completed, days after the satellite communications firm decided to suspend all launches from Russia-operated Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. OneWeb is building a broadband constellation that will initially consist of 648 satellites. More than 420 of them have reached orbit to date, all on Russian-built Soyuz rockets operated by France-based company Ariane Space. Recently Russia removed a Soyuz rocket topped with 36 OneWeb Internet satellites from its launch pad at Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Soyuz was originally supposed to lift off on March 4, but its mission became a casualty of Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. As conditions of launch, Roscosmos demanded that OneWeb guarantee the satellites would not be used for military purposes and that the United Kingdom government divest itself from the London-based company. Марта ракета взлетит только в случае, если мы получим гарантии того, что британцев больше в составе акционера OneWeb нет, и то, что мы должны получить гарантии того, что эта система не будет использоваться в иных целях, кроме гражданских. Если такой бумаги, еще раз говорю, юридически обязывающие, мы не получим, мы снимем ракету со старта. Those demands were not met, and OneWeb ordered its employees to leave Baikonur and announced that it was suspending launches of its satellites from the site. Russia then removed the Soyuz rocket topped with OneWeb satellites from its launch pad at Baikonur Cosmodrome and rolled the vehicle back to a nearby assembly and testing facility. According to Roscosmos, OneWeb satellites will remain at the facility until the situation is resolved and the rocket intended for the mission will be used for another flight. OneWeb planned to launch five more missions by the end of August to enable its low-Earth orbit constellation to provide global services. As per recent reports, OneWeb is in discussion with Ariane Space concerning how they will complete the contracted launches. Moreover, the broadband operator is looking at potential launches using US, Japanese, and Indian rocket suppliers. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. In April 2021, NASA awarded SpaceX a contract to develop, produce, and demonstrate the Starship human landing system needed to return astronauts to the moon. NASA recently published a PDF outlining the objectives, progress, and operational concept of the Starship Lunar Landing System. According to NASA, the system's three main goals are to transport crew to the lunar surface and return them to lunar orbit, to serve as a habitat on the lunar surface for early Artemis missions, and to house equipment for surface activities, such as moonwalks, sample collection, and scientific experiments. NASA also revealed the operational concept for the Starship HLS, which will be used as part of the Artemis 3 mission in 2026. The Starship HLS's mission profile calls for in-orbit propellant transfer. Prior to the launch of the HLS vehicle from Earth, a Starship variant configured as a propellant depot would be launched into low Earth orbit and partially or entirely filled by 4 to 14 Starship tanker flights carrying propellant. The depot starship, according to NASA imagery, will be taller than the tanker ships in order to hold as much fuel as possible. Furthermore, no flaps will be installed on the depot ship, indicating that SpaceX does not intend to return and land the ship on Earth for a reflight. So, either SpaceX and NASA intend to deorbit the depot ship, allowing it to burn up in the atmosphere, or the ship will orbit the Earth for as long as possible, serving as an on-orbit depot station for future Artemis missions. The rest of the operational concept for the HLS Starship is similar to what SpaceX revealed in previous years. After refueling the depot ship, a Starship HLS vehicle launched atop a super heavy booster will rendezvous with the already loaded propellant depot and refuel before transiting from Earth orbit to lunar orbit. With 24 mid-body thrusters for use near the lunar surface, the ship has a 100-day loiter capability in lunar orbit. Following that, a space launch system rocket will launch a NASA Orion spacecraft into lunar orbit, where it will rendezvous with the waiting Starship HLS lander. Orion's crew would then dock with and transfer to Starship HLS, which would then depart and descend to the lunar surface. Following the completion of lunar surface operations, Starship HLS will lift off from the moon and return to lunar orbit in order to rendezvous with Orion. The crew then transfers back to Orion and returns to Earth. The ship will remain in lunar orbit and may be refueled in the future to transport more crews and cargo to the lunar surface. Photos from the NASA document show that HLS Lunar Starship development is underway, with astronauts learning how to use the vehicle's elevator, which will deliver crew and cargo to the lunar surface. As per recent reports, NASA will get over $24 billion for space missions for the fiscal year 2022 if the U.S. Congress is able to pass a newly devised omnibus spending bill. The fund allocated to NASA is $760 million less than the Joe Biden-led administration's request.
but the funding for the Human Landing System program stays the same at $1.195 billion. Previously, Congress expressed reluctance to provide NASA with the funds it requested for the lander. Appropriators allocated only $850 million of the requested $3.4 billion for the lander in 2021. As a result of the cash shortage, NASA chose only one company, SpaceX, to develop its Starship vehicle into a lander, citing the company's low price tag as a major factor in that decision. Now, if NASA receives the money it requested for the landing system this year, Congress is calling on the space agency to deliver a publicly available plan, explaining how it will ensure safety, redundancy, sustainability, and competition in the human lunar lander program within 30 days of the bill's signing. The wording does not explicitly say that NASA must pick a second company to develop a human lander, but an earlier version of a House appropriation bill expressed concern about the agency's decision to select only one company. Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. Starbase remained relatively quiet last week owing in part to SpaceX's new focus on cybersecurity and overcoming signal jamming of its Starlink internet satellites amid Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine. However, there have been some exciting developments at the South Texas Starship factory since our last update. One of them is the stacking of SpaceX's newest super heavy booster prototype, Booster 7, the first of its kind which will house 33 new Raptor version 2 engines. The version 2 engine configuration significantly simplifies Raptor's design to make it easier to build, install, and operate. It also substantially increases maximum thrust from around 1.81 MN to at least 2.25 MN. In theory, if Booster 7 is outfitted with 33 Raptor version 2 engines capable of operating at that claimed thrust level, it could theoretically produce at least 40% more thrust than Booster 4, which is outfitted with 29 Raptor version 1 engines. Other design changes on Booster 7 include sleeker raceways that protect external wiring and plumbing during flight, a different layout of the pressure vessels, hydraulic power units, aero covers, and the umbilical panel installed on its aft section. Composite overwrapped pressure vessels, or COPVs, are used in Starships and Super Heavy boosters to hold helium gas at very high pressure for spinning up the turbopumps of the Raptor engines. These pressure vessels are capable of storing gases at up to almost 700 bar. A series of new sharp-edged aero covers will now be slotted over the top of two new pairs of five COPVs that run about a third of the way up Booster 7's tanks. They may function similarly to strakes or fixed wing-like structures designed to improve aerodynamic stability by controlling the airflow. Super Heavy Booster 4, on the other hand, has four sets of two COPVs spaced evenly around the outside of its engine section. Moreover, Booster 7 features an upgraded header tank design compared to Booster 4 the tank stores propellant needed for the landing burn. SpaceX has yet to put Booster 4 through a 29-engine static fire test, leading many to believe that the prototype will be retired before a test flight. Booster 7, possibly just a week or two away from test readiness, will be a viable replacement for Booster 4. However, SpaceX will likely need several more months to produce and qualify at least 33 flight-worthy Raptor version 2 engines for Booster 7. SpaceX employs a claw-like mechanism attached to the Starship's quick disconnect arm to stabilize the booster during stacking operations. The claw was recently removed from the QD arm for unknown reasons. Most likely, SpaceX is attempting to resolve some claw issues discovered during the recent stacking of Starship 20 and Booster 4. Booster 4 grid fin test was conducted on Saturday by rotating the fins with the help of grid fin actuators. Work at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility is progressing. SpaceX has begun assembling the orbital launch tower's beams and columns, which arrived at the facility more than a week ago. The tower sections, once fully prefabricated at the Roberts Road facility, will be transported to Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A for stacking. SpaceX recently installed a payload dispenser into Starship 24's nosecone barrel section. This payload dispenser can store and dispense stackable items into orbit from a cargo Starship, such as Starlink satellites and other payloads. The dispenser could also be retrofitted to deliver crew and cargo from a lunar starship to the lunar surface. The placement of the dispenser in the nosecone barrel section of Starship 24 suggests that the ship is a cargo starship mock-up. Deimos, one of SpaceX's Starship offshore launch and landing platforms, has arrived in Pascagoula, Mississippi, after a more than week-long journey across the sea. Its partner, Phobos, is currently undergoing work in that location, and we will soon see both vessels undergoing modifications at the same port.
Green Hydrogen International, a Texas-based energy startup, announced plans to develop the world's largest green hydrogen project in South Texas. According to the company, they plan to combine hydrogen with carbon dioxide at the port of Brownsville to create a green methane rocket fuel for Starship launch operations at the Starbase. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.